So while we wait for the session to start again, just here in the background, there's one of the tools that can visualize uh, the history of a Git repository. You see all these figures moving around and touching the different files in this repository. So um, this is what, what tools can do with this rich uh, history and metadata Git provides. And you can see this nice animations of people working on on different parts of a, a large code base. So this is from, from CTA Pipe, our analysis software for the Trank of Telescope Array. Okay, guys, thank you for uh, stay here or coming back from your break. Uh, we will continue with the second half of the JIT uh, lectures. So Max, please, <laughs> for yours. Yes, okay, so let's start back up. So we left when we wanted to start about uh, how you work together uh, using multiple branches. Um, and, and first I will introduce this general idea how, how you want to work together using this uh, multi-branch approach. And there are many different workflows you can use with Git to, to collaborate on code using multiple branches. But um, the simplest and most popular one is the so-called GitHub workflow. Um, and um, yeah, so this is, I, I would highly to suggest you to, if you don't have any major reasons to not use this workflow, which you will probably not have if you don't maintain a complicated, complex project, 
um, to stick with this workflow and use it for all of your projects. Uh, and there are a couple of rules and, and workflows or uh, methods um, connected to this. And the first rule is that you at, at no point in time directly add commits to the main branch or master branch, depending on, on how you are how you called your main branch and we will see how, how we can um, yeah, set this um, uh, in a couple of moments. Um, every time you start to work on a new feature or a new bug fix or, or any change at all, you start a new branch from the current version of the main branch uh, and make your changes on this branch. And then um, you propose that these changes should be merged into the main branch. And this is the only way changes are entering this main branch. So the only, only way um, there are changes coming or new commits coming to the main branch are via merging other branches into the main branch um, from the so-called feature branches. And these feature branches should be rather short-lived. So you create a new branch, you implement something, you propose it is that it is being or should be merged into the main branch. Um, at this stage, you might have um, code review or a continuous integration system running and checking that the code you added to this branch works uh, correctly and uh, follows the conventions of the project and, and so on. We will talk a bit about code review and continuous integration later. Um, and then at some point, someone will, will merge your branch or your, you yourself will merge your branch into the main branch. And after that, you should also delete um, the, the branch itself. The new changes are now part of the main branch and there's no need um, to keep this branch, this merged branch uh, around anymore. Um, and um, another rule for this is that the main branch always should contain a working version of your software. Of, of course there might and there will be bugs, but um, uh, you should make sure that all your tests are running before you merge uh, a branch and you, you let the um, code review process um, start uh, before you merge and, and so on. And uh, like this, you want to make sure that your main branch is uh, always uh, a working version of your software and it's not, not broken. Um, it can be used. It might not be the stable release version. It might be under heavy development and change a lot, but each version that enters the main branch should be a working version of your software. Um, and, and people are often confused when I tell them yeah, um, you should also use the GitHub workflow on GitLab. Um, but this is only because this workflow um, first started on GitHub and it's only named after this platform. It's completely independent of um, which hosting provider you, you choose for your repository. Um, you can do the GitHub workflow on GitLab. You can do the GitLab workflow on GitHub. Um, but I would really stick to this simple GitHub workflow of just opening uh, pull requests to um, get your uh, changes on a branch merged into the main branch. And the main branch should always contain a working version and nobody should ever directly commit um, new commits to the master branch or the main branch. Um, so um, let's talk a bit about how we work locally with branches. So we can use git branch to create a branch, git switch to, to switch to another branch. And because it's so common to, um, yeah, if I want to start working on a new feature, I, I want to switch to a branch I just created. There is a nice switch for this. So I can add the minus C option for, for minus minus create. Um, and then I basically do these two commands in one step. So I create a new branch named name and then immediately switch to it. Um, and um, when I made my changes in this other branch, um, I can merge the changes locally um, to when I do git merge another branch and that will merge the other branch into the branch I'm currently on. So let's say I make changes in, in some feature branch um, and commit them and to then merge them into the master, I have to go back to the master branch and then merge my feature branch into the master branch. Um, and this is also what we talked about earlier with the git restore. This git switch command is uh, rather new. I think uh, Tom found out the exact version. I think it was 2.25. Um, 
where this command was introduced. Uh, if you have an older version of Git, you might want to update or you have to use Git checkout also for switching branches. And the minus B switch is essentially the same as the minus C switch for Git switch. Um, yeah, so I, I would highly recommend to you to, to get a recent version of Git and use Git switch, Git restore, and um, not Git checkout for everything because it started getting confusing. If you do so many different things with the same command, the syntax is not as nice as with these newer commands. And this really, I think, made it easier to use Git because uh, I want to restore this file to the version it had. Then it's Git restore. I want to switch to another branch. Branch, it's Git switch. And you don't have to remember all the um, options you have to get a gift to Git checkout to, to make it work what you want to do. Um, and uh, as we discussed, um, there was a political correctness debate about the usage of this master and slave terminology. Um, in Git, there are not really any, any slave um, terminologies. This is uh, mainly was used for hardware or for databases where you have one master database and then replicate the database to um, another database for, for backup, which is then the slave database. And, and many uh, people agree now that this is um, not good terminology to use in master slave for this. So this was changed in many projects to um, use, for example, main and backup or main and secondary or, or so. Uh, and Git also followed suit here. So you can now set the default name of the, the branch you want to use as the default branch. And if you create a new repository directly on GitHub and GitLab, you will get a repository with the default branch name of main and not master anymore. Um, some projects have recently, um, who started with the master branch because there were older projects renamed their main branch. And you can do this easily on GitHub. Um, there's just a switch in the settings to, to rename the, the master branch to main. And this will also automatically update all the pull requests that are currently open. Um, if you have a uh, repository checked out locally, you have to do some manual steps. Um, okay. But um, I saw in the Slack that some people, um, um, uh, when they did uh, played along locally with the um, demo, they, they got a repository where the branch, uh, the main branch was named master and not main. And this is how you can, in, in recent versions of Git, I think it's around the same ballpark as restore and, and switch some, some 25 version or a bit earlier, you can set this default branch name. So if you run this command here, all your new repositories, repositories you will create with Git in it will use um, the main as a default branch name. Uh, however, um, I, I actually would recommend to you that you just create new repositories directly at the hosting provider of your choice and, and clone it, which is user, usually easier. You get all the initial readme and license and git ignore, which we will also talk about later, um, with just a click of a button. And this is it, it's usually much easier just to create the repository on the remote and then clone it to, to get the initial setup. Okay, so let's talk a bit about working on multiple branches and how this might create conflicts and, and how we resolve these conflicts. So I'm back in this um, demo repository here. Um, let's put back here our uh, tree thingy. Okay, so now we have a bit too many files here, but uh, should be all right. Um, so, Let's say I want to start to work on a new feature in this Fibonacci um, code base, and I, I want to do this on another branch. So let's do this modern git switch minus C, and I say, um, I don't know, uh, update example, for example. So you see here in my overview that there is now two branches pointing to the same commit. So my current checked out working directory is on the branch update example. So head points to update example, but main and origin main. So the version on the remote are also at this latest commit here we added in the first session. Git status now tells me I am on branch update example and I have modified the readme. Let's check what I did there. Oh, it's this full thing. So let's just throw that away. Git 
restore readme. And then we are clean again, git status. Okay, on branch update example, nothing to commit, working directory is clean, no changes made. So let's now do update this example. We could, for example, um, yeah, just print more than one Fibonacci number. Let's say for n in range 20, print all the, all the Fibonacci numbers up to 20. Okay, and now you see I have added another commit here. Let me shrink my front size one step so it fits. Um, so the main branch is still at this commit here. And the newly added commit on the update example branch was just added on, on top here. I can now switch back to um, to the main branch with git switch main. And then this just changes the head to main, but this branch here remains and has this newer commit. And I could also, for example, look at the diff between my main branch and the update example branch. So this shows me the difference. I basically of this single commit here. Um, and to demonstrate what happens if two people at the same time edit the same file and create these merge com uh, conflicts, I will now also edit the example on the main branch and edit the same lines we edited in our example. So if I, for example, change this to 20 here and say git add readme git commit print n equals 20 in example, then we have now really this branching situation. So we don't um, have uh, just one commit more in this uh, update example branch, but we have also a different commit on the main branch than before. So we have our, our latest common ancestor, um, the last common version we had before making any changes on these two branches here. Um, and then we have one commit each so this is really this tree-like structure um, branching away from this common ancestor here, um, going back to um, our two commits. And these are not compatible with each other because we edited the same lines in a different way. Um, so um, yeah, so we if we now wanted to merge this, um, we will get a conflict that we have to resolve manually. Um, so let's let's do this. We now merge our update example branch into our main branch. And then we get this message here. So there's a conflict, merge conflict in readme. The automatic merge failed. So Git tried for us to bring the two versions together, but because we edited the same lines in the same file, it cannot decide which version version should be taken or how it should be done automatically. So we have to resolve it by hand. And we need to fix the conflicts and then commit the result. So let's look again at git status. So we are on branch main. We are ahead of, of origin main by one commit. And we have unmerged paths. And the unmerged paths are both commits we want to merge modified the readme. We can look at the same thing in git status minus s, and this will say, okay, um, this uu means this was updated in both versions um, we were trying to merge. And now we have to edit this file in our, our editor. And what we will see here is this three-way um, merge conflict. So we have these markers here, marking the different versions um, we had. So in the middle here, because I, I made this option, um, I, I showed on the slides that I want to, to see all three versions. I have the last common ancestor. So this 07B8 commit here, which is the 
the last common commit of both branches. And then above, I see what is it is currently on my branch. Um, what is the head? So the, the main branch version where I, I changed the 10 to a 20, which is this commit here. And below, I have the version from the other branch I wanted to try and merge, which is the update example branch and, and this commit that uses a, a for loop for the example. And um, what I have to do now is just edit this file so that the end result is what I want. So um, yeah, let's just keep the version of this update example branch because it also prints 20 and I wanted to have 20, but I also like um, that, that we have all the numbers in a loop. Um, so yeah, let's just edit it, remove all, all the stuff that is not needed and keep the file in a way that it, it's a working example of what we want to have. And then we can write and quit, git status. Okay, we have still unmerged path, both modify readme, and now we have to git add the readme, git status minus s. Okay, modify the readme. All conflicts are resolved, um, but we are still merging. Use git commit to conclude the merge. Okay, let's commit. And for a merge commit, um, Git will um, pre-fill our commit message just with, with the merge, um, yeah, with this merge statement. So we wanted to merge, merge branch update example. And in most cases, you can just um, keep this. Um, I would suggest to you, if you have a complex um, merge conflict to resolve, where you have to yeah, make some decisions, you should also discuss uh, the decisions here. So let's do that. I mean, this is a really simplified example, but um, um, yeah, um, resolved conflict by keeping both changes increasing n to 20 and printing all the values in a loop. Okay, but this is, like I said, for most simple merges and conflict resolutions, you won't need to need to do this. But for more complicated stuff, I would encourage you to also write a custom commit message for uh, these uh, co uh, merge commits. And now we see here in this graph, we now have this merge commit, right? So we have our common ancestor, then the two commits that uh, branched away from this common ancestor, uh, and then the merge con uh, commit that um, brings them back together. And in this point, we can delete the update example branch because it's now merged and all the history is in the... Um, now in the in the main branch. And you see that we just deleted this named identifier to this commit here, but this branching structure, of course, through the parent relationships is still visible. So um, this commit here has two parents, the two commits that went into the merge. Okay. Uh, and if you also uh, uh, want to have this uh, three-way comparisons for the merge conflicts, by default, you will only get the current version in the one branch and the current version in the other branch. I would also highly recommend to you to run this um, command here that you want to have this diff three conflict style where you also have the last version that was there. So that, that basically goes back to this XKCD, right? Um, and this is the main criticism or main problem um, people are facing this, this conflict resolution. But really all you have to do is, is open the file, look for these, these markers here and edit the file so that it works for you. Basically you have to somehow um, yeah, leave it in a version that, that is what you want. And then just add and commit. So in the first session, um, we talked about this strange tech file I had lying around in my 
repository, um, which was created by my editor. Um, it's, a, it's a temporary file and it, it doesn't have any meaning in the long term, so it shouldn't be um, committed into the into the Git repository. The same goes for many other types of files. So anything basically that that's reproducibly created by um, by the repository or by the build system in the repository by scripts um, or that contains credential information or, or um, information that cannot be shared with the world um, that should not be in the Git repository. Um, and you want to make sure that you don't add these files by accident. Um, so we need uh, need a way to tell Git that it shouldn't care about these files and um, it should, shouldn't include them in the status prompt, it shouldn't add them when we add all the files uh, in the current working directory and so on. Um, so for this, we have the .git ignore file. Um, and, and this file contains one file name or directory name or a glob pattern um, for each type of file we want to completely ignore um, in this repository. And uh, what's nice is that the most hosting providers also, when you create a new directory, directly allow you to um, load a default git ignore for, for a specific language. So if you, for example, check um, this git repository here, um, there is a lot of git ignores for each of, of the programming language. Basically, every programming language has a default git ignore, and there's also one for Python. Um, and it ignores a lot of files that are usual in, in Python repositories, Python projects that you don't want to add to, to the repository. And this is always a good starting point. And then you can add um, more custom things you might need for your own repositories. So for example, if we um, actually run the file here, we should, no, we don't. Uh, that's interesting. I think we should get a PyCache. Oh, when I when I import it, I think. So from Fibonacci import Fibonacci. Um, and in, in the second I do this, Python actually compiles my Fibonacci file um, to the Python bytecode representation. I think we will uh, hear more about this tomorrow in um, in, in, in Tamas lecture. Um, and it creates this, these compiled files in these PyCache directories. And this is for sure also something we want to um, ignore in our, um, in our projects. So what I can do, oh, I, sorry, I, I need to just change my, my global git ignore here. I will explain in, in two seconds what this means. Um, so if I now do git status, you see that I have untracked files, the pycache file and the text file I talked about before. Uh, and now I can, can add this git ignore, git ignore file, and I can enter the names uh, pycache and text. And if I now do git status, um, the pycache file and text file will just be ignored. They will be gone. And I have a new untracked file named git ignore. And this git ignore should be added to the repository and committed and, and uploaded. So add git ignore git push. And then I will just revert this change I made and explain what what this global git ignore is, is about. Uh, okay. So um, additionally to a project specific um, git ignore, um, you will also want to probably create a global git ignore that contains configuration that should, I mean, file patterns same as the local git ignore, but that are ignored for all the repositories. And um, you should create this for you uh, and, and add files that are specific to your operating system or your editor or tool chain or, or whatever. 
So for example, I, I would highly encourage all Mac users to add these two things here to their uh, Mac, uh, to their global Git ignore, um, which are two common um, files that the um, finder I think on Mac creates to, to store metadata and which we don't want to have in Git repositories. So please do your fellow developers uh, a favor and add these to your git ignore and don't add them to any of the repositories. Um, same goes for the Vim users like me. Um, so Vim stores backup files uh, that are named .swap. Uh, and these should also not be added to the repository. And several other editors also have these kind of backup files, um, nano g edit or emacs, for example, use a tilde at the end of the file name. And this should also be ignored. And on Windows, of course, you have basically the same kind that's the DS store. This is called desktop.ini, which also is added to, to each and every directory you open with the Windows Explorer. And this should, of course, also not be added to the Git repository. So please add this to your global Git ignore file and run this command to actually make it use, use this global Git ignore file. OK. Um, and, and this was discussed at the end of the last sessions in the questions. So there are some things Git is not really good with. And, and this is basically anything that's not simple text files. So um, when we work with source code um, and even with documents, uh, LaTeX documents, we, we are always working with plain text files. Basically every, every code we work with is plain text. And Git is really, really excellent at, at handling these plain text files. Um, in general, everything that's not a plain text file um, can get a bit problematic. So that concerns everything like images, documents uh, from these normal word processors, um, Excel tables, PDF files, binary data files, you, you name it, you can all think of um, binary data formats um, that some of your programs will create. And Git cannot really efficiently store these in the history, and especially it cannot um, store the changes efficiently or show you git diff for a picture or git diff for a word document. And when you store files like these in the uh, git history uh, and, and change them using commits um, quite re regularly, the repository size will grow very quickly because um, basically git will add just snapshots of these uh, files like they are to the um, to the history and cannot really compress them effectively as it does with the um, text files. Um, and the same goes a bit for Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks are text. They are stored as JSON files, which is, which is a custom, uh, which is a standardized data format. Um, and and Jupyter chooses, uh, chooses to use a specific layout of JSON um, to, to store these Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they are a bit hard to use with Git. So there are, for example, that if you plot using Matplotlib, there will be graphics just embedded into the notebook. Um, the merge conflict resolution can be very hard to do. Um, the diffs are not really what, what we would like to see because you, you see all this additional JSON syntax, which you might not be used to. Um, but there's um, tooling to, to improve this. So there's um, nbdime you can try to use. Um, I will just open their, their web page, I think. So this is basically a, a local tool which you can use to use um, to compare notebooks uh, across different versions. So it uh, provides the commands nbdiff, nbmerge, nbdiff web, nbmerge web. Um, so um, yeah, just look at the screenshot here. So it basically works like the git diff, but nicely for notebooks and shows you where things have changed um, between two versions of a notebook. So if you're working regularly with, with notebooks in Git, you probably want to check out this, this nbdime tool. Um, for code reviews on, on GitHub, there's um, an extension called Review NB, um, which allows you to make review comments in, in Jupyter Notebooks nicely in the GitHub web interface. And um, the most important thing, uh, I would highly recommend to you to always only commit notebooks that are cleared of all outputs. So before saving and uh, creating a Git commit to update a repository, 
please always run clear all outputs. Um, and that will make the diff and the changes much, much more easy to, um, to see uh, and, and uh, will also make the files much smaller. Um, so this was the point in time where I wanted to be in uh, after the first session. So this is just the um, the summary slide basically uh, for you as a reference. So we have this form areas of Git. We have our working directory on our hard disk. Then we have the two local areas of Git um, where the staging is happening, preparing the next commit and all the commits in our history are stored in this .git directory in the repository. And then we have the servers uh, like GitHub and GitLab where we can push and fetch um, the changes from and to. And uh, this was also a question in the first session. So what exactly is Git pull? Um, Git pull is doing a Git fetch and then merging um, the local branch with the remote branch to get the, the changes from the remote into your currently um, checked out branch locally. And you can see all these, I mean, the usual workflow, right? You add, commit, push to upload changes and you can use um, git restore, git switch and git checkout to, to get stuff from the history into the working directory. Okay, so uh, I will just skip this at this point because we had the, the question section at the end of the first session um, and go on to discussing the different git hosting providers you can use. So um, Git hosting providers are, are basically web platform services that add um, additional features to, to using Git for you to use. And there are many um, providers. Um, I will discuss some uh, in the next slides. And there are also several self-hosted alternatives that you can install on your own server, on your own computer to have um, yeah, your own hosted Git service. And the most uh, widely known is, I think, GitLab, which has a free community edition, which you can install on your own machine and own service to, to self-host a Git server. And these, um, these platforms usually provide much more than just uh, a place where you can upload a repository. They usually have everything or at least some of, of the points here and maybe even more. So they have issue trackers where you can um, have tickets for, for bug reports, for feature requests, where you can plan your, your project direction, um, manage tasks, who should, should work on, on which topics and so on. They enable code review through this pull request mechanism where you can propose to merge your branch into the main branch and then people can comment directly online in the code. Um, and um, you, you will have to address the request changes before your merge request is, is uh, approved and merge into the main branch. Um, other stuff includes like wiki pages and project man management systems. Um, we will discuss continuous integration a bit further down the line and much more on Thursday in the testing lecture. And uh, of course, you will want to make release versions of your software. And this is also provided by many of these hosting providers. The big three are um, GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. And of these, um, GitHub sticks out a bit as the by, by far largest hoster. So the most users, most projects are on GitHub. It is since I think two years now um, owned by Microsoft and many open source projects are mainly developed on GitHub. And this includes, for example, Python itself. So we can... Um, look at the, the GitHub repository of, of Python, the language. So this is the, the GitHub repository for the Python programming language, um, which is currently in preparing the next release of version 3.10, which is now in feature freeze, and then already working on the next 3.11 um, version. Um, and you can see all, also all the contributors, for example, here, Guido von Rossum was the original um, creator of Python. And you can actually contribute to, to Python using pull requests on GitHub. 
Um, so some of the standing uh, outstanding features of GitHub are that if you register, you get unlimited private repositories um, and public repositories, of course. Um, so there's a free CI service for public repositories. And you can, as a student or teacher or researcher, you can get GitHub Pro, which include, includes additional features and, for example, also um, CI server capacity for private repositories um, when you go to GitHub Education. GitLab um, comes in two forms. Uh, first, it is an open source community edition, um, which you can install on your own servers, and then you can self-run your own GitLab instance locally on your computers. And second, this product is also deployed on, on GitLab's own servers um, at gitlab.com, which is then very similar to GitHub. So you have a um, Git hosting provider um, run by, by the GitLab guys, uh, and you can just use it. Um, you also get unlimited private repositories, um, and you uh, have more features with an enterprise edition. This goes both for self-hosting on on-premise and um, having more features like uh, more CI minutes uh, and so on on the hosted version at gitlab.com. Um, third is um, Bitbucket. It has um, unlimited private repositories, but it limits how many people contribute to those. Um, public repositories are also free. And in my experience, um, Bitbucket yeah, lags far behind GitHub and GitLab when it comes to features and the number of open source projects and the number of active users and, and so on. So um, yeah, I would choose one of these two and probably um, anyway create a, a GitHub account to be able to contribute to the many open source projects that are hosted on GitHub. This includes NumPy, Matplotlib, basically any larger Python package, um, several other large open source projects many, many, many projects on, on GitHub. So um, one, one thing I want to also discuss is that you can communicate with these servers about two different channels. Um, so the default you might have used um, when you cloned the repository is to use HTTPS. You just give the um, basically the same link your browser uses to get to the clone command. But what you can also do is using um, SSH private and public keys to authenticate and to use SSH to um, communicate. And this has the advantage of being a, a method where you can use your local um, SSH agent to be able to only uh, enter your password once per login session. Um, and then you can just get push and pull um, as often as you like without having to um, input your password. You might have seen me um, in the first session entering the password to my private key um, at the first push I made, but then I didn't need to um, yeah, use a password for, for every push afterwards. So to make this work, you need to use SSH and you need to um, add at least one public key to your profile on GitHub. And it, it's the best practice to not use the same key for every service and machine, but to create um, single keys for each machine and each service. So I would recommend on each machine you want to use for, for GitHub, create a, a new key like this here. So you can use this new um, elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography standard to create this um, SSH key using this command. You add a comment that it's a GitHub key for a username at machine, so um, your username for GitHub and the machine you're currently on and store this in, in a .github file. And then you can copy the output of the public key, very important, only copy and publish the public key of this and add this to your profile. Um, and, and like this, you can then also communicate um, over SSH, and then you have to only switch to the other um, format for the URL. So if you um, if you look here on the um, green button to clone, you can either use HTTPS or SSH, and then the this URL changes, and you have to um, if you want to use SSH, you just use the the SSH URL and you are set for cloning and um, then you are all set up.
So the, the feature I want to discuss next for uh, these GitHub uh, and GitLab hosting providers are the pull and merge requests. This is the same thing, really. It's just a different name. So um, GitHub calls these pull requests. Uh, and GitLab calls these merge requests, but it's the same thing. You push a new branch and you ask for that branch to be merged into the main branch or any other branch you want to, to merge it into. Um, so the workflow is like this, this GitHub workflow we discussed before. Um, you create a new branch, you push it, and then you open this pull request. Um, and, and pull requests are the place where code review happens. So project maintainers look at your code, they can comment on on the code and your co-developers can also look at your code and they ask for changes and you discuss those change requests, you implement the changes. And at some point, um, everybody is uh, happy with the changes and then the pull request gets merged. And usually we also have a continuous integration system running that um, performs the unit test suite, um, checks that everything is working all right and adds a green check mark to, um, to your uh, pull request that that all the tests have passed and that it's all right to merge this pull request and it uh, won't break the software in the main branch. And, and I cannot stress this in, enough, and I think Rachel also mentioned this um, yesterday, how important code reviews are for um, a software development workflow. This is easily the, the place where I learned the most from, from my co-developers. So, extensive code reviews, going over the code changes, discussing how you can improve your code is, is among the most important parts of software development, along with having unit tests and, and continuous integration. It's, it's really, really crucial to, to having uh, a good software development workflow. And it's very similar to the peer review process for scientific papers. And, and like we discussed yesterday, it should just get also part of this process that also the software is peer reviewed. Um, you get early feedback and advice for improvements. It prevents easy to find mistakes. So if I look at your code and I see um, um, you made some change and it introduces a bug, I see it and I can tell you um, here you made a mistake and please fix this before we can, can merge this pull request or um, I, I see you made some changes and you didn't include a unit test for that yet, that yet. so I ask you to, to please also add a new unit test. And this really ensures quality, performance, documentation, clarity of the software. And, and like I said, um, when you make a habit of doing code reviews, also among your peers, you, you learn a lot just by discussing several strategies for the code and uh, discussing ideas how you could improve. Um, code and you, you will always learn something new from from your code developers. So please, please um, get started with doing code reviews. And I have a I have a list here how um, how you should do code review um, to get started. So the first thing is you should uh, automatize as much checks as possible so they don't have to be performed by a human being. Um, so this includes static code checks. For example, there is a PyFlex tool which can analyze all your Python code for mistakes. Um, maybe I just show this uh, in the live demo uh, in, in a minute. Um, then there is a unit test which will be discussed in depth in, uh, on Thursday in the unit testing lecture and, and coverage which is related to this and we will also discuss. And then the CI system, which is basically the whole system which applies these checks before the human needs to, to check your code. And then also um, similar to static code checks, we cannot just uh, check the syntactic correctness of the code, but also if uh, the code follows the code style guidelines we use for our repository. So then after this, have uh, these checks have all passed and gave the green light, um, the human review should start and, and you should focus on um, mainly if there are enough unit tests if these uh, code changes and the tests are clear, explained, and are following the best practices for the language of the project and the conventions your project is using. Um, then you can maybe check if there are any obvious performance improvements to be done. Um, but keep in mind that that premature optimization is, is the root of all evil, as Donald Knuth has said. Um, but for example, um, in 
in our code, it regularly happens that someone is uh, opening a pull request and implementing some new feature and, and using, for example, a, a Python for loop to loop over some values and calculating some stuff. And there's a much, much faster one line approach with some NumPy function or existing functionality in packages that can do this much better. And so we would, would um, suggest in a code review to, to change that part of the code then to, to use this NumPy functionality, for example. And then uh, check uh, if you have documentation in place, um, are there the doc strings to the, um, the Python code, are there the corresponding sections um, in the code um, documented? And, and lastly, this is something um, you might, might need to get used to. So code reviews, because we have to do so many of them in, in larger projects, um, we usually don't begin by, by wishing you a good day and, and ask how you are. We, we just get right to the business. Um, but um, this is what I summarized by, um, stay friendly, but be concise. So be, don't be surprised if there are some some hard questions about your code or some some change requests. This is how this goes. Um, maybe you have to get a bit accustomed to this, but this is only um, to really get your code to to the level where it can be included into the project. And um, you will really learn a lot uh, in this process. And really, really, please, please. Um, get into this habit of of reviewing your code, even even your own code. So regularly, I for projects I just work on alone. I I will open a pull request and then myself do a final round of code review for my own code. Um, when I before I'm I click the merge button. Okay, so maybe we will just demonstrate this um, in our our project here. So I said I, I show shortly this, this PyFlex tool. I think we installed it also in the school environment. Um, so for example, if I import NumPy here, but just doesn't, um, it, it doesn't use NumPy actually in the code. I can use this PyFlex tool to run it on the, on the Fibonacci file. And it will report to me that I um, imported NumPy, although I didn't use it. And this is considered an error. You shouldn't import stuff you don't need. Um, and my editor does this also in the editor. So if you give it a second, you will see a warning here that um, NumPy is not accessed in the code. So I will delete this line. And then the check runs again. And this is a kind of check you can always run in the pull request system. So um, let's let's switch to a new branch to implement maybe another feature. Uh, I don't know, maybe a generator. So let's also implement a Fibonacci generator. Def fib gen just a simple example. So we want to just um, give the first n Fibonacci numbers. This is not the most efficient way to do this, but hey, um, this works. So if you now do from Fibonacci import fibgen. We can do something like this for n in fibgen 10 print n. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I printed n. I did a, made a mistake here. Oh, yes, I, I always return Fibonacci n. So this is a place where we should, should have written unit tests before, right? And this would also be, maybe I leave it in. Let's leave it in. It's an easy to spot mistake. That's exactly the point for code review. Okay. Let's just imagine I did that. And then I can 
push, and this is the first time I push a new branch, so I have to do this minus u origin generator. And Git is so friendly to directly display a URL here, which I can click to, to open the new pull request. Um, didn't I commit? Oh, I think I didn't commit the latest, uh, didn't push the. No, I did. Sorry for this. Let's see how we can. Ah, okay, so now it's working. I don't know what, what happened there. So uh, we can open a new pull request now. I will make it slightly larger. So it filled in the, the one commit and here are all the changes. And then I can just say create pull request. And this basically now um, yeah, is, is a request to the project maintainer to look at this, um, make a code review. And then um, if, if the project maintainer agrees with the changes I made, they can, can merge it into the master branch. So a code review would now happen like this. Let's switch to the point of view of the maintainer and I have a close look at the code and I see, uh, I think this is wrong. You should yield Fibonacci of I here. And I can say, I want to start a review and then this is the only comment I want to make, and I can request changes. I cannot request changes because I'm the one opening the pull request. Okay, um, this is not the limitation of this live demo where I do it alone. Um, but um, in a real world scenario, I would now request changes, which I cannot do on, on a pull request I opened myself. So I will just comment this. Um, and then the contributor would see this here. And, and now, okay, we have to go back to the code. And then I can can fix this here and say something like fix bug in generator address code review comments and push this. And then the maintainer is happy, can resolve this code review con conversation and merge the pull request. And like we discussed, these feature branches should be short-lived. So after I merged, I can immediately delete the branch um, on GitHub and switch back to my main branch here. Git pull to get the latest changes after my merge, and then also delete my local copy of the generator branch. This is the workflow you will have to use if you um, want to contribute to a repository where you are. Um, a contributor. So if, if the, uh, it's your project or you're working in a group and it's in a GitHub organization where you have write access to, you can do this. Um, but maybe you want to contribute to a repository where you don't have write access to. And GitHub um, has a mechanism for this and GitLab as well, um, where you can make a copy of a repository in your own namespace make any changes there and then propose a pull request to the main repository. And this is called forking. So if you fork a repository on GitHub, um, this will essentially copy the official repository of a software into your local namespace. For example, um, when I want to contribute to matplotlib, I fork matplotlib slash matplotlib on GitHub to maxnö slash matplotlib. So I have a copy of the repository in my own namespace. Um, and then I can make the changes and create a pull request to the main repository. 
from my forked repository. And this is arguably the most important feature and the reason why Git is so successful because it's such an easy way to contribute to every project that's on GitHub. Using this mechanism, you don't need to ask permission first to, to get write access and the maintainers don't need to give you write access to the full repository. You can just create a copy, make your changes in your own copy and then propose the maintainers of the software you want to contribute to that they merge your changes into their main branch. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, you then have maybe the problem um, if you regularly contribute to a fork repository that you need to keep your fork up to date. Um, and this um, is possible by adding both the uh, main repository and the forked repository as up, uh, as remotes to your Git repository. So um, maybe as, a, as an exercise, um, I would encourage you um, to fork um, the repository, um, but, but uh, in this example, it's the school repository. I would encourage you to, to uh, fork the um, live demo repository. So let's go back to GitHub to this um, escape 2021 git demo and everyone following along, you could just try to, to fork it here to press the fork button. I obviously cannot do this um, for my own account. I could clone it into another organization I'm, um, I'm a member of, but um, you could fork this repository now um, to your own account and make changes and then propose a pull request. So maybe, I don't know how, how well this was, will work with the number of participants we have, but let's just say um, we open open a participants, participants.md, um, basically just the I was here, and then I add my username here, and uh, just to avoid too many merge conflicts, I will... Um, at several bullet points here. And if you try to do this alphabetically, then it should, should minimize the number of merge conflicts we have to resolve by editing the same file um, all over the place. So let's say, please add your name in alphabetic order. Get add participants. at participants. Okay, so if you now fork the repository and clone it, um, you can, can uh, make changes on your branch, push this to your own repository and uh, open a pull request. You can even do this from the GitHub interface itself. So instead of clicking fork and doing this locally, you could even just um, click on the edit button here. And then it will also fork the repository and you can edit it online on GitHub. But I would, uh, for the exercise sake, um, suggest to you that you actually fork the repository. I see six people already did this now um, and um, work, work locally. So if you then clone your own forked version using the URL you get displayed in the GitHub interface, you will get the repository um, of your own fork. And then you should add the original re uh, repository as a secondary mode. And here this upstream name is also convention for the name of the original repository. So you will have the origin remote, which points to your forked version of the repository, and you will have the upstream remote, which is the original remote. Um, you can do this like this. So git add remote upstream, and then replace your username with my username. So it's the original repository, or go to the original repository and copy the link from there. And then you can uh, fetch all the um, changes from this upstream repository. So git fetch upstream. Git fetch uses a default remote, which is origin, and then you can specify the upstream remote to fetch from another repository, another remote. 
Um, and when you do this, it's important. Um, sorry. Um, that when you start a new pull request, that you always start from the most current main or master branch from the main repository. And this you can ensure by doing git fetch upstream to get the latest changes and then create a new branch that exactly starts at the current upstream master or upstream main version. You make your changes and commit. And when, the, uh, when you push the branch, you push it to your um, origin and not to the upstream because you don't have write access to the upstream, which is why you forked uh, in the first place. So you have to git push minus u to origin um, to push your changes to the new branch. And then you can go to GitHub or click the link like I did um, in the uh, demo example to, um, to open the pull request. So again, if I do this here, um, git switch minus c add, uh, maybe I can just add Axel to the participants. So we have an, someone starting with an A. So I add, add Axel Donut here. I commit. And then I can push to my origin and the branch name I just created. And then Git again will display me here the URL I need to use to open the pull request. Create pull request. Oh, and I see someone else was also already successful. She is from Germany. That looks okay. So I approve the changes here and merge the pull request. And now because it's from a fork, I cannot just delete the branch, but uh, Noah should uh, Delete should be able to see the delete branch button here to, to remove um, the branch from his fork. And then the file on the main branch is updated here. And I will also merge this pull request now. And then let's see how many forks and pull requests we can get for this demo repository today. Um, so um, the one other feature we discussed in the introduction is, is that uh, GitHub and GitLab also offer issue trackers. And the, these are very important for every software project. So this is a way for your users to report bugs or feature requests. They are a way for yourself or for your group of developers to, um, to work together, to plan the project, um, to discuss the next things that need to be done um, and so on. And issues can also be linked to commits and pull requests. For example, if you open an issue, um, so let's just do that. So maybe someone um, doesn't want to, to do the work themselves, but just ask for a feature and we are so nice to do this. So maybe um, at Tamash, uh, this is a very big bug. So Tamash Gal is missing from the uh, participants. And we can, can create this issue. Um, and this is now um, issue number five because GitHub has a common counter for the issues and the pull request. Uh, and we can now fix this locally. So let's go back to our demo repository here and go back to the main branch and get the latest changes with git pull. And then we can, can add Tamash to the Um, to the participants. And when we now do 
git commit minus m and say add tamash and then do some magic incantation here, which is fixes number five. As soon as we will merge this commit into the main branch, which will be immediately because I'm on the main branch. So let's maybe switch to another branch first. Um, git switch add tamas and then do the git commit add tamas fixes number five. Um, I forgot to git add. Git push minus u origin at tamas. So we add the name, we create the pull request. And because I mentioned this, this issue number here in this commit, um, this issue will be automatically closed when I merge this pull request. And you see here that GitHub also understood that um, I added a commit that references this issue. So I can even click on, on the issue number here, which is really helpful. And now I can, um, merge this pull request here. And this will result automatically in that this issue is now closed. So because I merged uh, a commit that has fixes the commit number in, in the commit message, this issue is now closed. OK, same thing here. Um, just as an example for the slides, we just did this. So let's talk a bit in the last couple of minutes about um, uh, uh, about continuous integration. And um, if you if you strictly interpreted the the term continuous integration, that means that you should often integrate your changes into the main version. Basically, always when you do a new thing check that it's still working with the main version of your code. And this is usually implemented by running automated builds and checks on a dedicated server for each time you push a new branch or push a new commit to an existing branch or open a pull request. So for Git projects, especially um, these checks on pull requests are not run on the branch itself, but on the merged result. So it Git basically, um, tries to merge your pull request into the master in a temporary branch and then runs the checks on it because you want to know uh, if the checks still work after you merge your um, pull request. And this is really important and, and you should require that uh, the CI system is passing successfully for each of your pull requests. Um, Common features of these CI systems include that they can build your application or library, of course. You, you need to be able to compile your code if you have a compiled code base. They run your unit test suite and all of the above they do on multiple operating systems and software and compiler versions. So you can make sure that your software runs on all the platforms you want to support, not just on your local development machine or um, on another machine you have at hand, um, but really you can define what operating systems you want to test on and which software and compiler versions you want to use. Um, it can also build your documentation and packages and upload them to, to publish your results. And we will see that um, in work in the packaging talk um, on Thursday, how you can use your CI system to, to publish a Python project directly to, to PyPI to, to publish it. I have set up, um, a simple example repository for this Fibonacci stuff um, on my GitHub account. I don't want to, to code it live because it's a bit of a hassle to, to set this up, but we can go through this here on GitHub shortly. So um, this GitHub CI system works with a configuration in, in the YAML data format. And I can say, okay, I just call the CI. This should run on all push and pull request events. 
Um, this should just for this simple test just run on the latest Ubuntu version. And I want to basically test all the supported, currently supported Python versions. So this test will run on one operating system, but it will run with um, yeah, five different versions of Python, the, all the currently supported versions of Python. And then um, GitHub Actions uses these um, steps procedure. So you have different steps in your in your checks. And the first steps will always be some kind of setup. So um, the first step is just the, the checkout step, which will clone the repository. And then we have a setup Python um, step, which installs the, the Python in the corresponding version I defined above. Then we probably want to update pip here and um, build our package, install our package, test if the install also works in this editable mode, more, more about that on Thursday. Um, then we do the static code checks with uh, Flake 8 or PyFlakes, what, uh, what you prefer. So Flake 8 is a combination of this PyFlakes tool I showed before and a, a code style checker. So this um, checks both um, the syntactical correctness of your code and your adherence to the Python style guide. And then we run our PyTest suite um, and we will learn a lot more about how, how PyTest works in the lecture on Thursday as well. So now if I go to, to one of the full pull requests I opened here, you will see um, that this has 12 checks and we can show all the checks here. So we have for the pull request and the push event, we have these CI runs here and we can click on, on the details button here and see what, what the actual steps all did. For example, we can look at this um, PyTest step here and it, we see all the tests that have been run um, and that all the tests have passed. So 18 passed in 0.18 seconds. So our, our software system works and we can happily um, merge this pull request here because all the checks were successful and imagine we also did a code review. And again, what you actually put into your test suite and your, your CI system will be covered in the testing lecture on Thursday. So for the last 50 minutes, I don't know, I can, I don't think I can uh, go through all the examples I have here, but I want to show some more of the advanced features um, of Git. Um, and the first one um, is that we talked a lot about how you should make these small logically contained units of changes. And sometimes you maybe get, get into the flow and you work on a lot of stuff and you have multiple changes made that have nothing really to do with each other. And, um, maybe even in the same file. So you have a large code base, um, a large file with several functions, for example, and you change two of them, um, can, can imagine. Um, and, and then you want to make um, commits for each of the changes. And um, to do that, um, there's a very handy tool, which is git add minus p, the minus p is for partial. And that lets you, um, select interactively what parts of the changes you made you want to add to the next commit. Um, and I will just quickly create a demonstration for this in, in our demonstration here. So go back to the main branch, git pull. Okay, so let's say uh, we have two unrelated or semi-related edits here. So we could, for example, add um, a doc string here. Um, so let's say calculate the nth Fibonacci number using recursion and memoization, which is the, the caching approach to do this kind of things. So this could be the first um, change. And maybe we also add this main loop here to the, um, to the code example for n in fib gen 20 print n. 
So these are two completely unrelated changes, basically. So I have a documented documentation change, um, and I have uh, the the change of the example code that is run when I just execute this file. So I could say that I want to add um, only the documentation changes to the first commit and then the um, change of the main function or the main block here um, in a second commit. If I just would do git add, I would get both of these changes directly together and I don't want this, but I can use git add minus p for partial and then git will show me uh, an interactive dialog where I can choose if I want to add this or not. So this is a documentation change and I can press Y to add this. And this is the two remaining changes here together. And I can ask to, to get to make this even smaller so I can more finely grained decide what I want to add with S. And then I have now only this second documentation change which I also want to add with Y. And these are the other changes unrelated to this. So I don't want to add them. So I say no. And now when I look at git status, I have something that's maybe confusing to you, but I have both changes to be committed and local modifications to the same file. And the same shows in git status minus s. I have both edit changes and local modifications to the Fibonacci.py. And here is where the power of, of git diff minus minus stage three shows. So this will display to me really what, what will enter the next commit. And I can verify that this is only the documentation changes I wanted to make. So I can commit this now, add doc strings. And then again, can add minus P and now I have just this second change and I say yes and um, use generator in example. Okay. So this is a really powerful tool if you worked for a long time and forgot to make the, the small commits um, to, to Make, still still be able to make the small commits, although you have uh, edited a lot of files at the same time or a single file at multiple positions that don't have anything to do with each other. Okay, and now um, I will just shortly show you um, what you can do to, yeah, for example, fix typos. So you, you saw that um, I think in one of the earlier commit messages, I, I actually had a, um, a typo in the commit message and I will just show you how to do this. But first some disclaimers here, um, you should only modify the main and master or master branches history under really severe circumstances. So for example, if you by accident committed some sensitive data like a password into the history or if your um, repository got too large to be even pushed to the GitHub or GitLab providers because they have limits on the file sizes you can push there. So these are basically the only two conditions I would say where it's warranted to, to change the history of the master branch. And even in the first uh, position where you have sensitive data in the history, I would even say don't change the history because it's already too late. Somebody might have seen your, your password change the password, not the Git history, and don't care about an old password in your Git history. On the other hand, uh, obviously any commits you just have locally, you can just do what you want. You can remove them, you can uh, revert them, you can change them. If they are not yet pushed there, there is no, no problem. So you can just adapt those. Um, if you saw you made a typo, you can change them and then push them. Um, and the same goes with a bit more restriction uh, that depends on the conventions you have for your projects for feature branches. So most projects allow or even encourage people to clean up the history of feature branches before they merge them to the main branch. So you get a nice uh, in quotation marks here because there's um, different positions on what exactly constitutes a nice history um, uh, before you merge it. So you have a, a good readable Git log basically. 
And um, Git protects you a bit here, so you cannot just git push modified commits. But if you have uh, modified this, you, you need to make uh, this minus minus force option to to tell git it's okay to overwrite the history and live with the consequences that this um, entails. And um, GitHub and GitLab have a special setting for branch protection that prevents you to force push um, the master branch. Um, and this should be enabled by default, I think, for GitLab and GitLab, but you should make sure that this is the case. Um, one of the methods I, I use the, the most often is just when I have a typo in my last commit or forgot to include this file I wanted to include is this git commit minus minus amend. And this basically just changes the latest commit you have made. And we will just, just demonstrate this. So for example, um, if I clean up this readme a bit, Oops. And let me intentionally make a typo here in my commit message. Uh, again, git add. On, and then I see, oh, oh damn, I, I have a typo in my commit message. I can just do git commit minus minus amend. And please um, watch this hash here. So now it starts with d4c7. Let's remember that. So git commit minus minus amend. And it opens my editor and lets me edit this commit message. And I can, can fix my typo, save, and close. And this will replace the commit and change the message here, but it also and completely changed this hash. So this is now a completely different commit from Git's point of view, although I just changed two letters in the commit message. So this is what it means to, to rewrite the history of a, of a project, basically. Um, we just rewrote the history of, of one commit, but you can do much more complicated things with rewriting the history. Uh, and this is um, where, where Rebase comes into play. Um, Rebase is, is an extremely powerful tool. Um, and if you today used Git for the first time, I would probably um, discourage you from immediately checking this out. But for the more advanced users um, already listening, you might learn something new now. So um, Rebase can, can change the commit order. It can drop or edit single commits. It can merge multiple commits into one. Um, it, it's a very powerful tool um, in general. And it's especially useful if you um, replace git pull by uh, to not do merge, but do a rebase. So you can tell git that, it, that if you do git pull, you don't want to you do git fetch and then git merge, but you want to git pull and then uh, git fetch and then rebase. Um, and I will discuss what this does to your history um, on this slide. So uh, let's imagine a, a more complicated um, Git setup here. So we have a number of commits and we branched away um, from this B commit into a feature branch, which is now numbered into one, two, three. And then also on the main branch, other commits happen, um, C and D and E. And because we had to resolve some conflicts, we needed to merge the main or master branch into our feature branch, which created this num commit number two. And then there's also another commit on the main branch. Um, and then we, we finally merged our two branches together into this F commit. So um, what the rebase does instead of the merge is it, it can help us to um, yeah, to, to get a nicer history. So this has merges in both directions here. And this is something you usually um, maybe want to avoid. And what rebase does, so we, this is a situation before the rebase. Um, we have these A, B, C, and D commits um, and the one, two commits. And then we can rebase um, our, our master branch into our branch. And what this does is 
it first removes all our commits and applies just the commits in the master branch in order. So what we end up with is the straight order A, B, C, D, E. And then we have the one, two commits as now have as parent the E commit and not the B commit anymore. And then we can merge. And this results in, in what we call a nicer history. Um, so this would be the situation when we always merge. And this is the situation when we uh, rebase our feature branch and then merge it together with the main branch. And this results in this cleaner history where I just have this one branch where I added two new feature commits and then merge it back into the main branch. And this is what most com people would consider a nicer history, but can be a more complex to understand what it what is going on here. So this is, like I said, we are now in the advanced Git section of this, this lecture. Um, yeah, and I think this is the last one I will show. Um, there's also an interactive rebase where you can just really go, go nuts and edit the whole history of your project. So let's say, I mean, this is something I really wouldn't recommend under most um, circumstances, but we had this typo in one of the really early commits. Um, let's, let's see. Ah, yes, here. So there's a apply cache to Fibonacci. Um, so what I could do is do an interactive rebase until this commit here. And this will give me a list of all commits that happened since, since that commit I rebased onto. And I can now, for example, reorder commits. I can uh, remove commits so they never happened. Or I can, what, what I want to show you now, I just can revert the commit message of a single commit. And also, I will, I will restart my watch command here. Um, Keep an eye on these commit hashes here, because if I now change one commit early in the history, I will completely change the rest of the history as well, because all commits depend on all their parents. So let's revert this commit to fix a typo, which is not really a good reason to do a um, full rebase, but let's do this as a demo. And then my editor opens so I can edit this commit message here. I fix the typo and then I can do git rebase. Uh, and then I also get merge conflicts from the, the one merge we did. You remember, I have to now do this again. And we just took the uh, second part here. And now I have to do git rebase minus minus continue to um, to continue rewriting this history. And that was all the conflicts we had. And now I have a new history where all these commit hashes completely changed. Just to fix that one typo. But like I said, um, git is really, really, really powerful and it can do a lot of things. It doesn't mean necessarily that you should do these things. And I will revert these changes now with the reset command. So I can, can git fetch to get the version again from the remote. And I can now revert these changes in uh, hard resetting to the version on GitHub by saying, I want to hard reset on origin main. And then I get my history back here. And then we have the same commit has hash as before, and we have still the, the typo further down. Ah, and I thought there were questions about this um, in the um, in the Slack, so I will just continue to, to explain the submodules shortly. So um, Git, um, in contrast to other version control systems, discourages so-called mono repositories. Mono repositories means that you have uh, many different projects inside of one source control repository, version control repository. Um, and this is, for example, commonly used with SVN. So you have one SVN server for your whole company or your whole developer group. 
and you have many projects in this one um, subversion repository. But Git really discourages that, and um, you should use for each project its own Git repository. But still, it might be useful to include other Git repository into your own Git repository, for example, for um, external dependencies where you need the source code. This is commonly, for example, done to include Google test in C++ projects. Or if you have so-called meta repositories where you join many repositories together at specific versions to have um, also a history of which versions of software you use together. So for example, you could, uh, if you do a paper or a scientific study, you could create a, a repository for that paper and then add all the software you use as submodules at specific versions. So it's clear which versions of the software you used for that paper. Um, and only in the case you have submodules, you need this minus minus recursive flag. That was one of the questions I saw um, in the um, in the Slack channel. Um, so this is only needed if you have submodules in a Git repository, um, and you can update submodules using this command. But I think I won't go into more detail here. And now I'm finished, nearly on time. I can I think we can um, go a bit into the break for the questions, right, Toma? <laughs> Sorry for not leaving any time for questions in the in the schedule. Yes, no problem. We can take. Five minutes for questions. Yes, yeah, thanks again, Max, for, for all this. Uh, I have been collecting some of the questions, but uh, in fact, you were also paying attention to the Slack. So basically, some of these are been, um, uh, you already replied some of these questions. So I am just skimming my own list. Uh, some of them are very, let's say, at the beginning of your class and are in the more uh, deep part. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are comments, uh, or there is some common. Uh, oops. <clears throat> there are some comments that exist in JIT to ignore files instead of the creation of the JIT ignore. Uh, or is essentially just a word. For example, in the discussion was that the only workaround essentially would be to rewrite the JIT ignore in other way. <laughs> that open by, by hand, but do you know any other way to do it? Uh, sorry, what, I, I don't think I understood the uh, question. So, so the like question a, was concern, concerning the git ignore. Uh, so how you can you git ignore something from git without using the git ignore file? Or if that is possible? I, I, I don't really understand why you would want to, because I, the git ignore is just the way you do it. Let's, mm, let's okay. phrase it like this. Mm. I, I uh, for. I would have to understand the reason for the question why why someone wouldn't want to use a git ignore to git ignore stuff because that's the way git git handles these things. So you should use a git ignore to to do this. Thanks. Another that again uh, could can be uh, elementary confusion sometimes is that what is the difference between a branch and a fork in this case? Uh, how you can phrase that difference? Sorry. Uh, okay. So a branch is. Um, like I said, a named pointer to a commit inside a repository, which can be used to have separate versions inside one repository. So you can work on, on different stuff. So you, for example, you can in parallel work on many things and many people can work in parallel on many things on branches. And at some point you want to merge those branches uh, into the main branch to, to update the main version of your software. Uh, that's what, what branches are for. A fork is essentially a complete copy of a repository that you do from a main repository somewhere where you don't have write access to your own namespace on GitHub, for example. So you can make changes on a branch in that fork and then propose those changes to the main repository. So a branch is just a lightweight construct inside one Git repository, and the fork is a full copy of a repository from one namespace to another namespace, usually made to be able to make changes to a repository where you don't have write access. OK, thanks. There is another one here, uh, also quite, uh, I, I, at least I saw it many times and happened to me when I was starting to learn this, that when you create a suit repository, that it might, I, I translate like a folder when you create a folder directory inside the repo. It will be automatically initialized 
into JIT? Um, so I, think I, I am not sure I understand. The yes, the, in fact, it's like a kind of two question. One will be uh, if you create a sub repository inside the JIT, inside a ready JIT repo, it will automatically initialize. No, you need to. There, there are no, there is just no such thing <laughs> really. Okay. As a, so you can create subdirectories, but they will be part of the same repository. Um, the, the, uh, a sub repository, so to say, is what these Git sub modules are. And well, for this, you need uh, another repository that already is existing somewhere else. And then you, so you have to first create the other repository and then you can add that existing direct, uh, the, that existing repository to your repository using this Git submodule mechanism. Okay, so you know, cannot create a sub module from the from the the, the JIT repo. Um, As you mentioned you had to create. I, a... I think that's not possible, right? Mm. You would would just create the repository somewhere else and then add it as a submodule, yes. But I'm mm. not sure if, um, for this. It, there might be a way to just create it in in the repository okay. itself, but I'm I wouldn't recommend it. Mm. Um, so yes, I took that one also because sometimes you know when uh, you were also comparing with SVN and JIT, in SVN you used to well, you used to you can create empty directories and they just go. You know? and also I, I think I took the opportunity for this question maybe to remind that empty empty JIT sorry empty repos oh my God empty directories inside a JIT it will be invisible for JIT. No? Yes, so Git doesn't care about directories. It only cares about files. So as long as you don't add a file to a new directory, you you cannot um, add add a directory. So I, I sometimes see people do something like this. Sorry, I don't. I think I don't share anymore. Uh, no. Let me let me share back. Yes. Uh, so sometimes, if people really really want to add an empty directory for whatever reason. Um, I, I see see them do something like this. So they they make the new directory, and they do something like add a hidden file there, empty or so, and then you can git edit and git status minus s, and then it will show you edit a new directory with one hidden file in it that doesn't contain anything. But I, I also wouldn't recommend it. I mean, what is the reason you would want to add a, an empty directory to a Git repository? It doesn't contain anything. So yeah, no, just, I, yeah, just wait sure. until you have the first file that needs to go into this directory and then then add the file. I think that sometimes happens that people want like a create a structure or what is coming in the future. Yes. And, you know, you create four different folders just because you know it will be have something. But yeah. when you try to push, obviously, Obviously now, but let's say when you try to look in your GitHub repo, hey, what are my my skeleton folders? But yes, right, yeah, that's uh, something that I so many times I I just take advantage that you are explaining. Um, <clears throat> so there was a question. Sorry, I um, hopefully it makes sense. It says that the, does Git switch update your local code and file? So in the case that you were working in more than one branch and they have very different code. Yes. So all these commands that do something with the history will, will update your current working directory to the version you are looking at. So um, let's go back to, <clears throat> to this. I need to find my Zoom there. OK. All desktops, share again. So we can can go back to to our repository here, and instead of um, watching the file, let me let me watch the content of some, of one file here. So if I do, uh, let's just every second print out this Fibonacci thingy. Uh, let's get it in color, maybe. Huh? Okay, uh, never mind. Uh, this will now every second print out print out this file. Um, and if I now do git git checkout and alt commit, for example, um, the first version I, I had in this. 
the, the file content will, will change. So this really changes mm. the file that is currently in the working directory and the same goes for switching branches. So if the file um, is different on another branch, this will really change the file on disk. It basically will copy um, the version of the file you want from this .git directory into your current working directory. Okay, so thanks. It's quite important because uh, obviously you don't want to lose your jobs. Uh, yes, but Git will also warn you warn in, the, in these cases. So um, if if by doing Git check out another branch or Git switch to another branch, you would overwrite local changes, Git will just refuse to do this. And it will say um, here you, you would overwrite this file um, when you check this this branch out, please commit first or re remove the changes so we, so we can do this. Yeah, so Git protects you there. Okay. Yeah, in fact, this is what I was I wanted to, um, with the next question, like, uh, uh, if, if I accidentally pull instead of push, do I lose my local change or I can recover the state before? Uh, and, and I bring this question because, again, it can be relevant for the new, especially the new user on this, that exactly what you point out, that Git will not let you do this kind of thing yeah. without asking. So basically, you cannot accidentally pull instead of push because you have always to pull first before you can even push. So if there are changes on the remote and you want to push your version and it's not just compatible, uh, Git will refuse to do this. And you have to always pull first and resolve any conflicts if, if necessary before you can push again. So um, basically, the situation where you accidentally pulled instead of pushed won't happen because it forces you really to first pull, then push in these situations. Thanks. So yeah, again, this is quite useful because people sometimes they have some fears to you know, execute some comments and, <laughs> and be sure if they will lose on. But uh, this is why we would remind it that Git is proof. I, um, I mean, there are, are really commands that uh, can, sure. <laughs> can remove your local changes. I mean, we, we talked about Git restore, which is specifically designed to do this. So this will not warn you because it's a tool to do this. And if you use it by accident, you, you can of course lose changes you didn't want to lose. And in the last example with the rebase, I used this Git reset minus minus hard, which is also one of these commands, which, which will happily remove your local changes without asking. So. Be careful if you're if you're trying something with restore or reset or force or these dangerous options. Yeah. I have one, maybe one last one here uh, that can be also relevant in all, all these interaction GitHub, GitLab, and your local machines. If you set up an SSH key in GitHub, will this provide a verify used uh, user when commit? No, this uh, is only for the authentication when you are pushing. Um, so SSH keys are something different to the GPG keys you can use for signing commits. So I, like <laughs> I said, I, I didn't go into how you would set up this um, code signing procedure um, with Git in this lecture. I, I think there's a good documentation on GitHub how you would do that. But these are um, related but different kinds of keys. And you have to set up them, them differently than, than the SSH keys. The SSH keys are just for your authentication when pushing or pulling, not for the signing of commits. OK. So yes, this is what I have here. I mean, obviously, what more more questions? You also saw the the Slack conversation is, uh, but many of them were also reply were very specific also. And uh, so, thank you very much again for. A pleasure to be here. And again, just <laughs> or, a quick or not be here, but <laughs> a quick reminder: you also have a, a Thursday lesson in the afternoon where you continue with the continuous integration. <laughs> so please, guys, come also for that one so yeah thanks again for the uh, morning sessions i think uh, if it is nothing else we have finished um as i was mentioned also the afternoon is uh there is no lecture i would say instead of say it's free <laughs> we encourage you to maybe come back to all this different information from yesterday and obviously today with all these uh, git commands and procedures um because um, the idea is that you will have this incremental knowledge through the school. So most of the, many of the tools, if you know all the tools that you have seen yesterday and today will be uh, necessary for the, for the next classes. So please take a look on that. And if you have the chance, use this hour for, for, for um, review the material and obviously ask questions in the Slack if you have it. So maybe I can can just make an advertisement for one really cool website for um, for learning Git. This is called Learn Git Branching. 
And this is basically a guided tutorial where you will also go through that again, what we discussed today in your browser with an automatic um, help. So you can just, um, yeah, it, it explains to you what you, you need to do. Um, I will just quickly go here through the, um, through all the stuff. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. we should put this into, into the material, but this is really, really great stuff. And you, if you play along, you get very fast to the very advanced concepts of, of Git and, and highly recommend to go through this at least once. Maybe you can do this in the afternoon. I will put this in the, in the chat. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks again to everybody. And again, uh, uh, see you for the next lecture tomorrow and Again, the Slack is always there for any questions. Thanks again. Bye, everyone.